welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Rebecca. I'm the elder data scientist from uh, LinkedIn TikTok. Uh, we're excited to have you here today for another Rotational Labs uh, webinar. Today we're going to learn about vector databases. Um, and I imagine that many of you are coming into this with kind of already a slight idea about what vector databases are. Uh, maybe you've already checked out the docs for Pinecone or, or ChromaDB. Um, you know, maybe you're already using something, uh, or maybe you're kind of coming from the Elasticsearch tradition and wondering, you know, uh, do I really need to learn about another tool? Um, there is a lot of excitement right now about semantic search, which is exciting if you work in the kind of natural language processing space, because like suddenly semantic search and retrieval is cool. Um, and that also means there's a lot of hype right now. Um, so I read this thing on LinkedIn the other day by a data scientist um, and weather researcher named Justin Reed. He said, so much of the tech industry now feels like a medicine show pushing quack cures versus actual engineering and science. And I felt that deeply inside myself when I read it. Um, but that's why we're here today. So the goal today, this is, this is not sales. We're not going to be kind of trying to get you to use one tool over another. This is a no frills technical review um, about a new kind of database. And I am honored to introduce you to our speaker today because he has a PhD in databases. <laughs> this is his area of expertise. Um, Dr. Benjamin Bangfort is an expert in machine learning and distributed systems. He is um, an engineer turned founder. Um, he is a two-time O'Reilly author. He's the faculty director of Georgetown University's data science certificate program. And he's also co-founder and CEO of Rotational Labs. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Benford. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome everyone uh, to this webinar today. Uh, definitely no frills is the right way to talk about the discussion today. I think that um, I had fun uh, you know, reliving my graduate school days, and this is a very academic review uh, of the vector database topic. Um, and I wanted to include a lot of the terminology and acronyms in the slideshow because I know they appear as, uh, you know, preferences or settings in the documentation of the most common vector databases. Um, and so I thought it might be helpful just to explain uh, at least a little bit what these things are uh, so you know them when you see them. So let's, you know, start with uh, why are we talking about vector databases? <laughs> and the really the short answer is because of LLMs. Um, at the time of this research, uh, I counted well over 37 uh, new commercial vector databases uh, that you guys can use. There are a lot of them, and almost all of them were produced in the last five years, uh, and uh, they really are aligned very tightly uh, with new advances in LLMs and new applications in LLMs, uh, particularly following the advent of, you know, attention-based transformer models, uh, which I think is what brought LLMs into the public attention because uh, they uh, hallucinate uh, or or uh, and generate less. They hallucinate less and they generate far more sensible text. Um, so. If you're going to build an application uh, that uses an LLM, it's likely that you will need a database, and I think that's why all of these databases uh, have popped up. Um, but even though these commercial vector databases are only going back maybe five years or so, uh, I will say there is actually a substantial amount of academic research into the space going back uh, maybe 12 years. Um, and so I think it might be an interesting question as we discuss uh, this topic of, you know, are vector databases really necessary for your application or, or your workload? I mean, just because they're an interesting topic of academic research, uh, you know, that could be, it could be that they're sort of a niche topic. And, and I would encourage you to think about that uh, as we go through this presentation. So let's start from the basics and uh, build our way up and figure out, you know, what's a vector? What's a database? <laughs> so uh, let's start with databases. Uh, you know, databases are pieces of software uh, that manage your data, uh, and they really are oriented towards uh, users who are trying to query 
uh, their data effectively or to applications that need to access different pieces of the data at different times. Um, you know, I, I hope that's familiar to everyone. I know that data scientists uh, will occasionally steer clear of, of databases, um, you know, thinking they're more of a software engineering tool, but, uh, you know, especially when you see this description, right? DBMSs, database management systems, provide query optimization, transactions, scalability, fault tolerance, privacy, and security. And when you hear that kind of uh, description, you know, you definitely do think maybe more software engineering, DevOps, um, but I got to tell you, I, you know, even for my personal projects, managing my personal finances, having a database that I can query and ask questions of um, is, is usually one of the most effective ways for me to store data and to access it meaningfully. Uh, and, and it's very different than a file uh, or a file system in how you manage that data. When it comes to vector databases, these databases are oriented specifically to unstructured data and vector-specific query processing, which is really what this whole webinar is going to be about. So let's move over and start talking about vectors and what vectors are. Um, and you know, I think that at the highest possible level, we have to remember that uh, machine learning uh, and AI, they operate on numeric tables, right? And numeric representations of, of data. Um, and that's what a vector is. Uh, but more specifically, when it comes to vector databases, we really are thinking about the encoding of unstructured data, text and images in particular, as these d-dimensional feature points in a high-dimensional space. Um, and that allows us to perform a number of queries and different types of operations on these vectors, especially pairwise similarity comparisons. Um, so let's just dive into that a little bit more. Um, if you have taken my class at Georgetown, <laughs> you know that you'll know that there's this sort of generalized view of machine learning, right? Where all machine learning methods from the probabilistic methods, naive Bayes, uh, Gaussian mixture models, uh, to ensemble methods like gradient boosting and, you know, all the way up to the really high parameterized models like artificial neural networks, you know, what these models are doing is they are defining our instances of interest as feature vectors in this very high dimensional space. So I always think about, you know, there are points in this space and the relationship between those points are the patterns that machine learning algorithms extract, right? So when you're thinking about space, I mean, you can think about a, a baseball field or, you know, just, you know, things that are placed somewhere. Uh, what happens is that the distance between those points is similarity, right? So the closer something is uh, to another thing, the more similar it is, and the farther away it is, the less similar it is. So just as a quick example, you know, we can see that there are various feature extraction techniques where you can take an image uh, and you can run voxels over the image and extract a single, uh, you know, numeric vector. You know, for the sake of illustration, th these are three-dimensional vectors, right? Because I can kind of plot that out, right? So you can see there's a, you know, an X, Y, Z axis or a D0, D1, D2 axis, you know, and if this image is represented by this point, then, you know, that might be this point in space. Or we can use a text, you know, vectorization model uh, to encode text as the vector, and that might be this point in space. And uh, what you start to see is actually you could probably start comparing apples to apples and apples to oranges, uh, because these things are simply points that you can you can map. Now, the most important thing to remember about vectors is their dimensionality, and this word dimensionality is going to come up a lot, right, when we talk about different trade-offs and, and things that happen in, in uh, vector databases. But dimensionality here simply refers to the size of the vector, right? The number of components, right? So this is a three-dimensional vector because it has three components. When we're dealing with machine learning, we're generally speaking, we're using, you know, very high dimensional, very large dimensional uh, vectors. So that you can't plot them. You can't see these different points uh, without specialized uh, approximation techniques. 
So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about a very specific embedding, uh, and I'm going to focus primarily on language, because that seems to be the, the primary use case of vector databases right now. Um, images, video, and audio can all be stored in vector databases, um, but, you know, you can't, you know, put an image into a SQL query. So just for the sake of understandability, I'm going to focus on language. And the primary uh, type of vectorization for text uh, is something called embeddings, right? These are the most commonly used feature extraction techniques. Um, earlier, I mentioned uh, the, the fact that uh, LLMs and attention-based models have changed the game because of their sensibility and their, uh, their ability to generate really high-quality text. Um, a lot of that has to do with the use of embeddings, right? Uh, embeddings are what create these semantic representations uh, that uh, are, are form far more effective at characterizing uh, the contents or the meaning behind words. Um, there are three types of embeddings, generally speaking. Uh, Word-level embeddings, uh, which encode individual words. Uh, sentence level embeddings, which encode you know, whole sentences, and document embeddings, which encode larger documents that go beyond sentences. Um, and each of these different types of embeddings generally has more or less uh, dimensionality uh, and might be more or less effective for different uh, applications. Uh, the example I have here is uh, uh, sentence-based embeddings. Uh, so here you can see that we basically we have to take raw text, the brown bear ate the berries, uh, and we have to pre-process that text uh, into an array of tokenized strings. Um, that pre-processing will often involve uh, lemmatization, um, stemming, uh, and you know dealing with uh, case encoding. Um, spaces, punctuation, that kind of stuff. So, and, you know, uh, removing all of stop words. So there's usually a lot that goes into the pre-processing, but you'll end up in this with this array of tokens. Once you get that array of tokens, what you'll do is you'll one hot encode those tokens. So uh, this table is an example of that. Basically you take your vocabulary, right? All of the words in all of your documents across the entire corpus. You'll line them up uh, as a table and basically, you'll create a vector, uh, which is going to be of length of your vocabulary, and you'll put a one uh, where that word appears here. So if we would encode the sentence, you can see these representations of this five-dimensional vector, right, where there's sort of an on square uh, in this alphabetically ordered uh, list of vocabulary. The problem is, as you can imagine, if we just use these one-hot encodings, A, these are very sparse representations, right? Lots and lots of zeros. And two, the dimensionality of vocabulary is going to be very, very large, even if you remove stop words, right? Think about how many words are in the dictionary. Uh, I used to work for the Oxford English Dictionary uh, at Oxford University Press, and I think we had 585,000 uh, definitions, and that didn't include senses of words. That was just records inside of the, the, uh, the dictionary. Um, so models that use vocabulary or and, and these very sparse um, uh, vectors are very prone to the variance inside of the vectors, uh, and they tend to really isolate uh, very specific uh, types of uh, language-based constructions. So in order to create the embedding, what we're going to do is we're going to stream this sentence, right? So you can see all of these vectors are being streamed into either a recurrent neural network uh, or an LSTM uh, or some attention-based model. And the streaming part of this is important because it creates context, right? The sequence of words in most languages, but especially English, is important to the meaning of those sentences. So when we stream these words in with context and we run them through a neural network, what we can do is we can take the output of one of our neural layers and we can say that this is the embedding, right? This is the manifest that represents that vector. And that's a much more dense representation uh, so you can see that this the brown bear eats the berry, uh, or the brown bear ate the berries, uh, can you know be projected down into a much denser, smaller vector representation 
that can be then used to do language modeling. And what we've seen is that this has become very effective at semantic search. Now I'm gonna put that in quotes because this is really, it's algebraic, it's not semantic. Semantic refers to true meaning. And it is unclear whether the output layer of one of these neural networks for the embeddings is uh, you know, semantically um, relevant, right? I would say it's contextually relevant, right? Um, but we anecdotally can see this, right? So um, here we have two sentences, uh, the comedian heckled by crowd in Baltimore, stand up booed by audience in Maryland. And if you look at word level embeddings, this is kind of a famous example, what you can see is that, you know, booed and heckled should be very close together in this embedding space. Comedian and stand up are close together uh, in this space. Maryland and Baltimore should be close together in this space because in sentences, those words might be used in the same spot, right? Relative to arbitrary lengths of context. You know, and maybe audience and crowd, maybe those are farther apart, right? Like they should still be close together and close relative to like Maryland and Baltimore, but maybe those are a little bit farther apart. So you can sort of see how these embeddings uh, encode meaning based on the similarity of these words in, in their context. And LLMs take advantage of this by uh, predicting the likely next word that will come out of an arbitrarily long sequence uh, of words. So the example that I like to use is, you know, I went to the movie theater and buttered my blank, right? All of that context, I went to the movie theater and buttered my, is enough to predict the next word that comes in that sentence, which is likely popcorn. Um, and that's what these embeddings are effectively allowing you to do. Before we move on and take a couple of questions, I, you know, I will say that uh, you can embed more semantic information into your LLMs using knowledge graphs, uh, which actually have meaning uh, associated with them. Uh, but that's a topic for a different time. So for right now, maybe all I'll say is just remember that semantic here is in, in quotes. Uh, it's really this spatial representation based on similarity. These embeddings, closer embeddings are to each other. The more similar those things are, the farther apart those embeddings are, the more dissimilar they are. Are there any questions that I can take? Yes. Um, so uh, maybe, you know, one question to sort of connect to recent events. Um, last week, there was sort of a reported outage, uh, open AI outage that caused uh, ChatGPT to give back like very strange sort of incoherent messages for a few hours. Um, and following the event, OpenAI kind of put out a, um, you know, a, a report to, to explain, you know, what had happened with the incident. Um, and it seemed to be referencing something related to vectors, but it was a little bit oblique. Um, I'm wondering if you have any theories, you know, that kind of couched in this language of, um, what it means for something to be embedded and um, how, what semantic means um, and kind of how this like traversal might happen. Uh, can you sort of, I, I'm, I know you aren't affiliated with that model directly, <laughs> but I'm curious if you could help sort of explain it, um, you know, with these terms. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, Rebecca, you had a great post on LinkedIn about this and uh, I certainly um, buy into your theory. Uh, you know, there's, if you look at this embedding process, there's a lot of ways that this can go wrong, right? So first, you need a specific ordered vocabulary in order to even start with these one-hot encodings. You need to ensure that the pre-processing mechanism is pre-processing everything the same way and, and the correct way. Um, and so you can imagine that if you add vocabulary, like if you add a word, uh, to uh, an embedding model, that's going to change the output. Second, when we, you know, create an RNN or an attention-based transformer, uh, those neural networks are initialized with random weights, which means that as we sort of train these models based on the, using these unsupervised techniques uh, to create these embeddings, you know, they are stochastic. You can end up with different outputs. Um, and even though so, you know, in the end, unembedding has to be related 
to the specific embedding model that created it. Um, and if an LLM is using those embeddings, right, you can think of it as a model of models, then if any little thing in the embedding changes, then that can create nonsensical uh, or even just really random results. And, you know, Rebecca proposed that that's probably what happened uh, with the OpenAI open AI model, that they released a version of the LLM that had a sort of incorrect input embedding scheme. Uh, and I tend to agree with that assessment. Thank you, um, and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so another question. Um, there's somebody who's asking if you could sort of frame this idea of um, vector embeddings and you know ways of storing vector embeddings as a technique to um, the realm of like association rules, um, like item set mining, uh, and collaborative filtering. So the extent to which this sort of overlaps um, or are, you know, one is a technique for another type of problem um, to kind of connect them a little bit. Yeah, that's actually a great segue to, to my next slide here. So, you know, uh, association rule mining uh, has been long associated with relational databases, right? So, you know, the traditional example is uh, you know, given a shopping cart, what things normally go together, right? So if I'm going to buy cereal, then I'm probably also going to buy milk, right? If I'm going to buy bread, then I'm also going to buy butter. And, you know, the business intelligence community really leverage relational schemas in order to do association mining and, and F rule mining. Um, I will say that that also, that type of thing also does appear in vector databases, but you know, rather than having products characterized by ingredients or uh, you know some other uh, you know scheme or schema, instead you can just take product descriptions and even product images, and you can vectorize them, and you can find associations using the vectors. So that you know, association role mining in that type of business uh, set, I think, uh, is definitely something that vector databases are used for. Um, I have on this list recommendation systems, uh, which is what collaborative filtering tends to be used for. Um, and you know, here, you know, the the sort of extension of association role mining is not just what things are similar. Um, but or what things are purchased together, but also I have this user who has these preferences which are expressed as their previous purchases or their search history or something like that. And how can we make recommendations from this huge product world, this product category uh, based on that? Um, and vector uh, based systems are excellent for recommender systems uh, to do that. And usually just because you can code a lot more information into the vector about a product uh, than you could uh, using more traditional mach machine learning techniques. Or you could at least, at the very least, encode a lot more unstructured data <laughs> uh, as opposed to, um, uh, uh, you know, the structured relational information. So who knows, maybe someday we'll see that, you know, entire movies are encoded as vectors with their scripts and we find movie similarity and movie recommendations, like that's the next Netflix recommender. Uh, it's not just about the description of the movie, it's about the entire script <laughs> and, and maybe other properties. Uh, just in terms of other applications while we're on this uh, topic, uh, search is sort of the big thing uh, that most uh, vector databases are used for, both text and image search. So image search is kind of maybe the novel thing uh, here. Um, you know, if you have vague queries, right? You know, you don't have to specify these sort of precise Boolean search terms, right? Uh, you can specify more flexible type search and hopefully more results and more relevant results uh, are returned. Um, that plus the language generation component is usually parlayed into an application called retrieval augmented generation, uh, where essentially you can ask a question and you get a response right, uh, from that's like a written human response with the information that you're looking for, and usually on domain specific information, right? So, you know, rather than me asking Edwin, like, hey, how much was this contract with this client? 
I could ask the RAG and hopefully you would use our contract documents in order to respond with the answer. Uh, and it would it look something like, oh, in 2023, uh, you, you know, you and Ed signed this contract for this amount for this services period, right? It would actually be human language text. Um, and so because of those types of applications, I tend to think of LLMs as user interfaces, right? They interpret natural language, they produce natural language. They're more like an interface than an actual application themselves. The RAG is the application. Uh, along those lines, document summarization, distilling many documents into a single summary to, to uh, sort of create an entry point, automated captioning, describing what's inside of images. Uh, if you have a video counting, you know, how many vehicles go through a gate, right? Vector databases are used for that. Chatbots translation, just to name a few of the applications. But in principle, applications need databases, right? In order to do all of these things I just talked about, you need some database in order to query uh, and store this information uh, in order to make these applications possible. Um, it looks like there's a couple more questions I can pause again before I get into vector databases themselves. I think this might be an interesting one um, because it kind of takes us to the like um, domain expertise kind of side. So let's think about a situation where we've got like a um, uh, a lot of legal contracts or kind of like what you described. Um, you know, we're trying to find like most similar contract. So the the person asking this question is from the insurance and legal domain, um, and says. Would this technique be best for identifying if a legal contract has certain language regarding specific disclaimers? Um, you know, for example, in order to find other similar contracts that require for their investigation. So is this like, is this the only way to do this? Is this the best way to do it? You know, if if vector databases or vector similarity is is not the only solution, like what's what would you recommend? I mean, this is absolutely a great way to do this, right? So if you can encode all of your disclaimers, right, and 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 the required disclaimers as vectors, then you can match a legal document to all of the disclaimers that they match, and conversely detect what disclaimers are not matched. And then you can use similarity, this distance algorithm, to create a score, right? So uh, given a specific contract type where you expect these types of disclaimers, how well does this contract fit uh, those disclaimers? So yeah, this is absolutely a great start uh, to performing that type of review for contracts. Um, and you know, with anything that's high risk, you want human in the loop there. But you know, this is doing a lot of uh, work on behalf of the user, pulling up specific disclaimers that match or don't match. Uh, and allowing the user to better analyze its documents. You can, e you know, you can even create an application where you're highlighting the legal contract with respect to the disclaimers or annotating the legal document with respect to the disclaimers that are matched. Um, so absolutely an excellent use case and, and one that's well suited to semantic search and, and vector databases. Thank you. We do have a couple more questions, but maybe um, maybe I'll hold them and you can go into your slides a little bit more um, and we'll circle back. Great. Thank you all for all of the questions that you have. <laughs> all right. So applications need databases. So let's get into vector database management systems. So I'm going to start by categorizing them. I mentioned that I counted 37 <laughs> vector database commercial applications. Um, but I've, I'm group them, grouping them into sort of three primary types. So the first is native systems. Native systems are designed specifically for vector management. So things like Pinecone, Chroma, Milvis, and they really only do uh, vector databases. Uh, the next type of system is extended systems. So these are systems that have vector capabilities that are added on top of an existing database. So some vendors are providing this, like Mongo Atlas, Elastic, are providing vector capabilities on top of their databases. Um, but there are some open source ones that can augment, you know, like relational databases, PG Vector uh, being the big one for Postgres. Um, but there are others like um, uh, Pace and Analytics DBB. And then finally, you know, I included this category. There are some 
uh, software out there that are not databases in the way that I would normally think about them, right? You know, they're not uh, server systems or embedded databases, but really they're more like search engines or libraries that provide some vector capabilities. Um, so Lucene, Solar, uh, Face uh, all provide uh, uh, these type of, of capabilities. So when you think about sort of the relationship between native and extended systems in particular, uh, I have this graph here where you, uh, you have sort of this performance axis on the vertical axis and this sort of capability, right? The number of features that a database can provide on, on the x-axis here on this horizontal axis. So native vector databases are gonna provide the highest performance in terms of storage, uh, query performance, uh, speed, uh, hardware usage, that kind of stuff. Uh, but you know they really have limited capabilities because they're only going to be able to do vector type operations. Um, there are uh, a lot of hybrid systems, things that provide access both to the original instance that you can query on and to the vector. And so having to deal with both the vector and the instance is going to reduce your performance, right? But it's going to give you more capabilities uh, in the types of queries that you can conduct. Uh, when you're extending another database, you're definitely going to decrease your performance, right? Because you're going to really only get the sort of native performance of that database plus whatever, uh, you know, extra overhead you have for extending that with the vector components. Uh, NoSQL tends to be more focused on distributed computation and performance. Uh, relational, you know, personally, I think has the most in terms of feature and functionality that you're going to get, but it's going to be the slowest performance out of all of these databases. So when selecting a system, I think it is important to identify, is it native, is it extended? Uh, you know, if you already have an existing database, an extended system might be the way to go, especially to start. Uh, but if this is brand new, uh, you're just trying this out of proof of concept, then a native system is going to be far higher performance. So we're talking about vector databases in particular. So what are the primary characteristics, right? Beyond things like centralized storage, user access controls, you know, all that type of stuff that you would normally expect from a database. Uh, so the primary feature is distance-based query processing and vector-specific operators, right? We want to do this semantic similarity retrieval from our database. Um, in order to provide that, you're going to get vector specific storage and indexing in order to make those queries faster and to enable those operators to uh, perform sort of multi-tenant or parallel uh, computations. Um, in terms of storage, compression is a really big deal, especially with high dimensional vectors. Unlike maybe traditional data and relational database, vectors aren't as easily compressible, uh, especially if you want to perform computations on them. Uh, and so compressing them for, for storage is an important feature. Uh, and along with that is, is partitioning and navigable partitioning, uh, which will you know, both allow you to replicate your databases, but it will also improve the query and indexing performance. Uh, and we'll talk about partitioning uh, in a little bit. Finally, one of the biggest features that native vector databases provide is hardware acceleration, being able to use uh, GPUs, DPUs, TPUs, uh, and other types of you know, non-CPU compute to accelerate uh, computation in a way that a traditional database just won't provide, uh, because you can do these vectorized operations on, on top of that specific type of hardware. So those are the features. Uh, that is what you get, but I think maybe we should ask, like, why are these things hard, right? Why doesn't Postgres have this stuff? So let's talk about the challenges, the specific challenges for VectorDB, what VectorDBs actually have to solve. So the first thing is this idea of vague search criteria, right? Semantic similarity is actually hard to capture and is almost entirely reliant on the embedding methodology, right? So it is not so much something that you express when you're querying, it's more about that vector representation than anything else, right? So you can't give precise predicates and you can't guide your query 
in a way that you can with other databases, right? So, you know, for example, even just being able to use where clauses doesn't really exist in, in vector databases. You can't really filter your re results or direct to a certain space because you as a human can't compose a vector-based query. Um, also, <laughs> finding, like creating queries is actually relatively difficult. I'm going to talk about a couple of different queries, uh, you know, but range queries and, and KNN queries. Um, but you have to give a vector an input input point to those queries, and it's like, well, how do you how do you give that input point, right? Um, and and so that's that's where the vagueness comes from. Um, the other big problem is that comparisons are expensive. Right, so traditional database uh, operators and predicates are actually very easy to compute, and CPUs are actually designed to make those computations. But pairwise distance metrics is uh, very complex, and it relates to the dimensionality of the uh, of the embedding. Right, so the bigger your vector, the harder it is to make these comparison computations. I already mentioned data volume uh, and the need for compression, but there's also another problem is that you can't use projections, right? So, you know, in a normal database, if you have a record, you might say, I only want these fields. I only want name and age. You know, I can omit address and ID and, and you know, favorite color and those things. And so that actually makes query processing a lot faster. You can't project a vector. You have to have the entire vector. And you have to materialize the entire vector. So data volume becomes a big problem. And you often need large amounts of memory for vector databases, which is an important consideration. Uh, there's no schema, which means that there's a lack of structure. There's no natural sorting or partitioning, which means we have to use algorithmic strategies for that. And I'll talk about a few of those uh, today. Uh, there is also attribute incompatibility, right? You can't use set operations to query over sort of intermediate results and then combine them into a final set. And there's only a limited amount of relation to, you know, like, let's say I want to query everything that has to do with bears. Well, the vector doesn't know anything about bears. It's an embedding. So I have to like take bears and somehow embed that. And like that relation doesn't really exist inside of the database. Uh, and then we mentioned input stability, instability earlier. So if your embedding method changes, you need to change the entire database. You can't incrementally update it. So uh, in order to uh, solve these challenges and provide sort of a reasonable database management system, here is sort of the primary architecture of a vector database. So there's two primary pieces. Uh, the query processor and the storage manager. The storage manager uses some vector specific storage to store your vectors in blocks on disk on pages, potentially replicating them. Uh, and then the storage manager is also in charge of the search indexes, right? So all of the indexing that you're going to do to make have those sort of effective queries. On top of storage, there's query processing, right? So uh, I'm going to talk about a number of different queries here shortly, the types of queries that you can ask a vector database. Uh, those queries need to be planned using operators, right? So scanning, sorting, projections, like um, which are not relational projections, but which are vector-based projections. Um, and like, how do we create a plan for executing these queries? Um, and then, you know, there will often be an opt query optimizer to optimize the plan, make sure it's as efficient as possible. And then there's an executor which needs to actually perform the query on behalf of potentially multiple concurrent users at a time. So generally speaking, this is what the architecture of a vector database looks like. Um, before I go into the types of queries and the indexes, uh, should, is there any questions that you want to toss in here about this section? So there, there is kind of an emerging theme in the remaining questions. They're more at the application level and less on the database level. So potentially I should wait until you get through kind of the rest of the database level stuff, um, but just to kind of flag that. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, let's uh, talk about queries and indexes and then we can get into that, that type of stuff. All right, so the first type of query uh, that vector databases have to handle is data manipulation queries. So these are things like insert, update, delete. 
Um, and again, the challenge for a vector database is that their their an embedding model embedding model is needed to do any type of data manipulation. So, what you'll see is there's sort of two approaches that vector databases take. So the first is direct manipulation, right? Users can put in whatever vectors they want. It's up to the user to maintain the embedding models or the vectorization method. Uh, and you know what can end up happening is you can end up having a database that is vectorized has you know entities in it with different vectorization techniques or you know whatever. But you know basically the vector database just says the user has to figure it out. Uh, I think becoming more popular is indirect manipulation, right? So the user only knows about instances, but the database handles the vectorization. And this is either handled in two ways, either a user-defined function, right? You have to specify some function, usually in Python, uh, that will output a vector, um, or you can choose from a list of existing pre-trained models. Uh, and you just sort of say, for this collection, I want to use this um, you know, embedding model. Uh, so that indirect manipulation is becoming more common. But uh, ensuring high quality collections means that you're always using the same embedding model and that you know all of the inserts, updates, and updates are correct with respect to the target model uh, that you're using. Um, so that's sort of the, the main concern when it comes to data manipulation. The second type of query, and you know, this is the sort of bread and bones of vector databases. This is what you can do with a vector database that you can't do with any other database uh, is vector search. So vector search or vector queries uh, start with a given input or inputs queue. Uh, those inputs are themselves vectors. And the goal is to find K similar vectors with slack C. So up here, I have this little chart here. So we have vector search. Um, and the first type of search is a range search. So a range search says, given an input query Q, find all instances within a specified radius, right? So again, if, if I want to find all documents related to you know, bears, uh, you know, I might encode a vector with bears and maybe berries and salmon or something, encode that vector. That's my input Q. And I'll say, give me everything within, you know, this distance R that's related to it. And then, you know, the larger R is, the more documents that you're going to collect. Uh, and some of those documents might be less related. The smaller R is, um, the uh, fewer documents you're going to get, but the more relevant those things are going to be. Figuring out what R is. It's tough <laughs> because you need to understand the space of your data. Some vector databases give hints uh, about R, but it really usually is trial and error in my experience of, of figuring out how R with range queries. Um, the best thing a vector database can give you is sort of the diameter of the vector space, right? Like what's the, what's the maximum distance R? And then you can kind of, you know, search in between that. Uh, the other type of query is nearest neighbors, right? So that's the CK search, where K is the number of results you want to return, and C is the amount of slack, right? How how similar or dissimilar you're willing for these uh, uh, entities to, to be. So for an exact search, C is equal to zero, right? No slack. You have to exactly match these vectors. Uh, and so you can do K nearest neighbors search with K greater than one, or you can try to find an exact match. Give me this exact vector with K equals one. Uh, you can also do approximated search, right? So you can give more slack to the model. Uh, and so approximate nearest neighbors, you know, is, you know, find me the thing that's closest to this vector that I'm putting in within the slack C, uh, or you can do approximate K nearest neighbors search, you know, give me the K neighbors that is closest to this, this item. And honestly, those nearest neighbors and range queries that is the basis of all of the applications that I listed before, right? Is being able to uh, collect records based on similarity rather than on sort of rote attributes. So that begs the question of like, what is similarity? And if you've been a data scientist for any period of time, uh, you'll know that distance can be computed in a number of different ways. Uh, and, you know, the distance between two points has a lot of different meanings. So uh, 
what the database is going to do for you is it's going to allow you to select a similarity metric to use. And uh, I have sort of five here, uh, you know, hamming, which is like the number of components in the vector that differ, uh, the inner product uh, or the inner dot product of two vectors using the vector norms is another distance metric. Uh, cosine distance is a very popular distance metric for, um, you know, comparing text, right? So you're taking the angle between those two vectors. Uh, and then Mikowski is, you know, taxi cab, Euclidean distance. Uh, it's sort of a generalized distance metric, but it is Euclidean distance. And then Mahalanobis is a variant of Minkowski distance that takes into account the variance of your data set. So these are sort of the five normal distance metrics that your vector database is going to provide you. Um, the problem is, is that one, you have to select a similarity metric, right? You have to select one of these things, but the results that you're gonna get back are gonna be very affected by what choice of similarity metric you make and what the dimensionality of your vectors is. And it's always important in vector databases to remember the cursive dimensionality, which says as the dimensionality increases, the distance between the two farthest and the two nearest vectors approaches zero, right? So all of these points that come together as you increase the dimensionality of your data set uh, relative to the variance in your data set and, and how much variance you have. And I will say text-based data sets, generally speaking, don't have a lot of variance, right? Uh, the variance is aligned upon on like spe specific components when it comes to text. So, you know, what you have to juggle is this embedding model that you choose, the similarity model that you choose, and the corpus that you have stored in the in the data set. And the database isn't going to tell you what the right combination of those three things is. <laughs> like you, you have to figure that out. And and that's uh, that's one of the tricky parts. All right, in terms of other query types, uh, batch queries uh, are meant to take care of hardware, advantage of hardware acceleration. Hybrid or predicated queries allow you to query not just the vector, but also the attributes of the uh, original instance, which requires a database that has a hybrid. Uh, and then the last thing that you're gonna see is multi-vector queries, which I'm not gonna get into really today, but if you see these terms, MQSF, MQMF, SQMF, these are referring to multi-vector queries that use aggregations and aggregated scores to query across multiple vectors. And often multi-vector queries are associated with images because images are often represented as multiple vectors, right? Either using like color components uh, or different types of convolutions. So I just wanted to throw that in here. Now I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna kind of quickly uh, go through the rest here. Um, you know, the, the sort of key thing in order to understanding the performance of your vector database is the access patterns and how the indexes and data is stored on disk that allows those access patterns. So there are sort of three types of workloads that I'm considering. So the first is machine learning, right? So if you want to train a model off of these vectors, whether it's a language model or a classifier or uh, something else, machine learning really just needs to do repeated sequential scans of the entire data set. And for machine learning, order doesn't matter. Right, so often append-only storage where you just sort of stick vectors in at the end, that's fine for machine learning because it's just going to read from the start all the way to the end, sort of over and over again in an iterative fashion. For semantic search, which we just talked about, this is actually a read-heavy workload that queries a finite set of related uh, records. So you do want some kind of uh, ordering, uh, you know. So here you can see sorted storage, right? But what makes sorted storage hard is that when you put it, when you insert, you have to move everything around. So you can imagine if you insert something right between these two orange things, you got to move everything in the database. So inserts tend to be hard if you have some kind of organized sorted storage. Um, so if you have like a recommender, that's a read write heavy workload that also needs to optimize for inserts, you're going to often end up with some kind of blocked or partitioned storage to minimize the effect of like how writing into your database is going to change your underlying results. And this is really where the trees come in. So uh, indexes are ways of organizing how your data is queried and, and retrieved from disk. And vector databases make use of sort of three different types of indexes. Uh, Table-based indexes, which use hash functions for quick lookups. 
uh, tree-based indexes, which use a partitioning me uh, mechanism to split uh, your vectors into groups, into related groups. Uh, and finally, graph indices overlays a graph such that the vectors are the nodes and the edges contain distance information. And then you can use uh, graph traversal and graph query algorithms to query that index. Now, I'm going to skip over the details of these, but they are in the slides. And one of the reasons that I wanted to have these types of indexes in the slides is because these acronyms, LSH, L2H, Quant, um, you know, KD tree, RP tree, and NOI, you're, you know, you're actually going to see those things when you're configuring your databases, Open Search, Pinecone, Chroma. They're going to like give you options for these things. So they're here in the slides. Uh, you can reference them later uh, if you're trying to figure out what these things are and what they're good for and, and uh, you know, when you should be using them versus other things. So to conclude, uh, I just want to talk about sort of open problems and what people are working on in the vector database uh, space, uh, sort of the future state of the art. Uh, the first is automatic similarity score selection, right? So I mentioned that the embedding plus the similarity score plus the specific documents uh, is uh, going to define the performance of your vector database and search when you do search on your database. So people are looking to make techniques to make automatic selections of those scores and those embeddings. Uh, on the database research level, operator design. So new hybrid operators and new algorithms are becoming important as a research topic. Uh, as are things like incremental search, right, where you want a large K in your K nearest neighbors, but you want to stream these data to your user without interrupting other database operations. Uh, and that's actually quite difficult because ordering relative to distance can be tough. Uh, Multi-vector search is an open uh, area of questions, which is why LLMs are primarily used with vector databases. Images and video are sort of slowly coming online as we figure out more and better multi-vector searches. And then the sort of uh, evergreen problem is security and privacy. Uh, how do you deal with that inside of a, a vector database, especially using things like differential privacy, uh, tombstoning, erasure? Um, how should the database handle those things in a vector context? Now, we talked a lot about a lot, about a lot of different stuff, uh, and I didn't mention like a full list of the vector databases. Uh, so I did just want to leave you with this vector DB comparison table. Uh, by Superlinked, uh, which has sort of the, the, the 37 databases I mentioned, uh, along with their features and sort of the different properties that they have uh, relative to what I talked about in this slide deck. So I know I rushed through at the end, but maybe we can take the last five minutes to wrap up some of those last questions about application. That would be great. Um, so if we're thinking at the sort of applications uh, architecture level, um, there were, you know, a few questions and, and notes, um, you know, that it still seems like it's hard to figure out what even the core components are, like chatbot, RAG, LLM, knowledge graph, how do they connect to each other, how do they fit together, you know, um, like, how, like, what is kind of, what is that, um, that kind of snapshot that connects all of those pieces together? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So the database is sort of is the sort of middle like the connective tissue to all of this so uh let's start with a rag right so what your vector database will hold is the documents that need to be retrieved right so the input will come in it'll be vectorized you'll perform this similarity query on the database the documents will be retrieved and then you'll send those documents to an llm to generate the text with respect to those documents so you can see the the database is in the middle uh for uh, you know, recommender systems, uh, you know, there's going to be this sort of uh, world of application outside of the vector database, including information about users, information about products, the various management systems, uh, and then sort of the reads and writes into the vector database that represent the users and the products, so that you can perform usually graph-based queries. And, you know, the graph-based indexes are the best for recommender systems. So you know, the 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 vector database sits in the middle, but you have to build a lot of things around it or on top of it. And even in my description, you know, I noted the vector database is really only dealing with the embeddings. The LLM that you use is going to be a separate thing outside of the vector database. 
Can you use the vector database as a pre-process store for training an LLM? Absolutely, yes. Uh, and probably you should just for good data management, but you know it's better than storing things in files on disk. But the LLM is outside of the vector database. The vector database is just a uh, connective um, part of the architecture. Um, do you know of any uh, of any of the options out there for vector databases? Give any support for sort of like out of the box, um, you know, high performance vectorization where you don't have to like actually do all of the work, all of the kind of engineering work to get everything loaded in in order to build a proof of concept to even discover if it was worth the time in the first place. <laughs> yeah, the one I would recommend is Pinecone. Uh, so Pinecone is the one that has REST APIs to connect to Hugging Face. And so it's very easy to use Pinecone. Um, Chroma also has some built-in vectorizers. Chroma uses Langchain. So if you're more familiar with Langchain, then you can use Chroma. So Chroma and Pinecone would be my two recommendations, but I certainly haven't tried all 37 of these. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm not selling anything, but those are the ones to start with. <laughs> uh, so, and I swear I didn't, I didn't plant this one. Somebody wants to know, can you use Ensign uh, to do uh, knowledge base or RAG implementations? Yeah, absolutely. Ensign um, is, is actually really effective at uh, using and managing uh, vectors, particularly if they're coming in in streaming order. Um, so, you know, I, Ensign is one of the indirect uh, vector databases. The user has to specify the vector uh, to put inside of Ensign, but uh, what Ensign is going to do is it's going to do anomaly detection, uh, deduplication, and it can use similarity uh, on those vectors in order to, to perform that anomaly detection and, and uh, uh, deduplication. We primarily use Ensign for training domain-specific LLMs, right? So for taking a transformer model and then training it on a specific corpus because you need a defined data set of vectors, right? Which we can specify in Ensign as like a start offset and an end offset. So it gives you that sort of repeatable training uh, for, for doing LLMs. Um, in terms of RAGs, uh, we uh, have thought about creating an, uh, a, you know, basically a distance similarity based index on top of Ensign to allow top those types of RAG queries on Ensign. Ensign does have a SQL uh, query mechanism on top of it. Um, so if you are interested in using Ensign for a RAG, uh, please talk to us because we can start to build one of these indexes. Uh, probably one of the tree-based indexes would be most well-suited to, to what Ensign can do. And Very thank cool. you for that question. Very <laughs> cool. Yeah, thank you so much, Benjamin. I, we are out of time. Um, thanks, everybody who joined us. Uh, we have another webinar coming up in two weeks with yours truly. I'll be talking about AI for normies. So if you have a boss or an executive above you who needs kind of a crash course um, or that you need to kind of like figure out how to communicate with them, tell them to come to my class um, and uh, we'll see you to the at the next one. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Thanks, everyone.